But Einstein doesn't come up with idea of uh, e equals mc squared just on his own, you know. It just doesn't invent that kind of thing. Lots of people are doing lots of research and making really good observations and stuff for Einstein to be able to come up with that lovely little quantum leap. But Max Planck, for instance, Planck, <laughs> he's a German scientist, and Max Planck said, well, you know what? My observations are leading me to, to believe that, that when matter absorbs energy, it doesn't just absorb energy in continuous stream, but it absorbs it in little chunks or, 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 or quanta, quantum. Quantum is like a little, it's a piece, it's a chunk. Matter absorbs energy in chunks and releases it in chunks. So that kind of actually means that, that energy is maybe quantized or packaged, and that means it behaves very much like, like matter does, because matter is packaged, right? Oh, wow. Okay. So this is where Einstein comes up with photons, right? So like photons of light, they're energy packages, right? So, okay, so Max Planck and Einstein, uh, we get all of these ideas that, that energy uh, is, is, is in packages. And, and so, you know, so that means that also that, that, uh, that matter can be expressed as energy. And you know, well, an electron, an electron is such a small particle that it has properties of being both matter and energy. Um, I just happen to be a very large object, so I am far more matter-like than energy-like, but I do have energy properties as well. Kind of cool. Now, Bohr says, you know what, all of this I'm going to put together and try to give a model for the atom now, and I'm going to try to, to take Rutherford's work where we've got a nucleus with protons in it, and I'm going to say, okay, what are, where are those electrons and what are they doing? Because that's key. We've got to figure out what the heck those electrons are doing. Well, those electrons, I believe, are on certain energy levels, okay? And, and so uh, Bohr described the energy of hydrogen uh, and, and the energy levels of hydrogen, and he did a fantastic job with it and came up with a great formula. Unfortunately, the formula really only works for hydrogen, and it kind of falls apart for everything else. But that doesn't mean that Bohr didn't know what he was doing. Absolute wonderful genius of a person who came up with <clears throat> energy levels, which perfectly describes what's going on in the atom in terms of energy. Now look, you got one proton in a nucleus of a hydrogen atom, and we're going to put in the ground state, and it's just kind of chilled out state, hydrogen's electron in the lowest energy level possible, which is called n equals 1. Now, the first step, so that's one electron there, E negative, that's a proton there, P positive. n equals 1 is the first level. There's no such thing as n equals 0. Electrons can't be found there. And the interesting thing is, we need, if we wanted to, you know, because you can't do this, you know, hydrogen is matter here, right? So you can add energy to it. And what you do when you add energy, Bohr says, is that, you know how substances can absorb and release energy? Well, we're going to absorb a certain quantity or package of energy, and we can then take the electron, which is the thing that moves in the atom, and we can have it transition from n equals 1 to, let's say, n equals 2. Now, if you're going to do that, that requires energy, right? Okay. And it actually requires a discrete amount of energy. You just can't add oh, I'm going to add half the amount of energy and maybe the electron will go to n equals one and a half? No such thing. If it doesn't get that whole discrete package of energy, it will not elevate and go up. And by the way, that electron doesn't move because if it moved, it would actually could be caught in between any uh, either of these two levels. But an electron can only exist at n equals one or n equals two, which means that this space here is not allowed for it to be in. How do electrons get then from here to here if they don't actually physically move? Transition, like I said, that's pretty cool. Okay, now, if we take the electron and we move it from n equals 1 and we put it up here to n equals 2, we are adding energy to do that to go from here to here. Now, Bohr described that by saying, okay, if you want to know what that change in energy is going from n equals 1 to n equals 2, that's the final place, that's the initial place. The Z describes the charge in the nucleus, which for hydrogen is just 1. And since it's, this formula only works for hydrogen, Z is always 1. Okay, that's just the, the, the charge of the, the nucleus, so the, the amount of protons there are. So, you put a 1 here, you a 1 here. The N is the N equals level. That's called the principal quantum number level. And um, final is 2. Initial is 1. 
When you do this math here, you get a negative number. And that negative times this negative gives you a positive change in energy, which means that the reaction is endothermic, positive energy. That means that it takes energy to make the electron transition from n equals 1 to n equals 2, or from n equals 1 to n equals 10,643. Hey, all of those are pretty cool calculations that you could do until you actually remove the electron entirely from the atom, and that's moving it to n equals infinity. And that's when we call the atom ionized, or having that, or turning that atom into an ion now because we remove an electron. Cool. Now, by the way, if we took an electron and moved it, say, from n equals 4 to n equals 2, what is that? Well, that's a release of energy because when you put that 2 here and that 4 here and do that math, that's going to be like, well, what you're going to get here is a number that's going to be positive. Positive times a negative means a negative change in energy. What does that mean? Energy is released. The negative in front of energy quantity means it's released. And of course, an, an, uh, uh, energy is released when an electron goes from n equals 4 to n equals 2. And then, when you use Planck and you use Einstein and you put those things together, you know what you can do? You can calculate the frequency and wavelength of that energy because here's the thing. You know, if you know Planck's formula, which is that energy equals H frequency, and you know C equals lambda frequency, which is wavelength times speed. I haven't gone into those in great detail, but you can actually take this energy, once you calculate it, you can find the frequency, and the frequency, you can find the wavelength of that photon of energy. Sometimes, energy falls into the visible light spectrum. And if you take uh, a transition in hydrogen that goes from n equals 6, 5, 4, or 3 down to n equals 2, all the wavelengths that you will calculate for those packages of energy that come off all fall into the visible light spectrum. Which means then, when you actually put something called a spectral photometer up against your eye and you look at an, uh, an emission discharge of hydrogen being excited by electricity, you see four distinct color bands and four only. That doesn't mean that there are only those types of energy coming off. There are some that are just invisible. But you get four bands of color. And that's how we know when we look at like a star or something like that and we say, oh, look at those four bands of color. It must have hydrogen in it. Oh, that's pretty clever.